So I'm going to talk about Ember today. Uh, if you saw the abstract for my talk, basically the idea was that I am going to show uh, not just a hello world. So a lot of talks will, you know, you, it's sort of like superhero movies. You go to see a superhero movie, and pretty much every single time it's an origin story. So you get to see how superhero, how Superman got created, how Batman, Spider-Man, whatever. And basically every single time it's the same story over and over again. And eventually you say, I don't really want to see origin stories anymore. I want to see like what it's like to be Batman. And that's sort of how I feel about my talk today, is I don't want to show you yet again the first 30 minutes of writing an Ember app, because I think not only have you seen it a lot, it's also not that representative of what it's like to actually write Ember apps or any other thing. Um, so what I'm going to do um, in a little bit after I first talk a little is I'm going to just dive into the app that I work on every day and show you, I'll add a feature to it. And you can see how that works. And uh, hopefully it will make sense. But the idea is basically to show you the whole workflow, not just like little bits or pieces, not just stuff that demos well. Although it occurs to me right now that I left the implementation, and so the first step is going to be deleting the implementation. So before I start, I just I had a thing I wanted to get off my chest about this stuff, which is I wanted to talk about data binding for a little bit. Because in the JavaScript community, you hear a lot about data bindings. And I think also, uh, a lot of people have come up with a lot of different strategies to implement something that you can call data binding. And People, because they're marketing whatever their new thing is, whether it's Ember, or Angular, or React, Knockout, they're always wanting to highlight the differences between their approaches. And so it's very hard to get a good sense of like what's the big picture? What is, what's happening here? And so I wanted to start off by showing both like what is the general idea when people say data mining, what do they mean exactly? What's, what's um, the same about all these systems? And then also how, uh, what's different about them? And, um, how each system might work a little bit differently, what the pros and cons are, and you, I, you can sort of get from that uh, what the right path is going forward. Like, uh, and I think you'll see over time that frameworks will start to converge, and that's because everyone will take the good ideas from everyone else. So even though today you sort of hear like Angular is like dirty checking, clearly is the way to go, and React or virtual DOM is the way to go, um, I think really uh, we're going to see more and more convergence of these ideas over time. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. So I'm going to start off by with a template. So here's a, a simple template. Um, it's in Ember syntax, but basically, even React, which is very proud of not having a template engine, has a thing which is you, uh, how you make HTML. And it's written in a syntax that looks a little bit like HTML for most people. So I'm going to sort of paper over that detail. I'm sure React people will be very angry at me for that. But I'm going to paper over that detail. And sort of, I'll go with the Ember syntax, but it's kind of, um, kind of general. So, the idea is you have a template, and your template has a bunch of static pieces, like the word hello here, and then some dynamic pieces, like the word, word name. And from a high level, there's basically three things that happen in, in the life cycle of a data mining. There's the initial instantiation, the creation, taking that template and converting it into some, some piece of DOM. Then there's mutations that can happen from the outside world, like you get an AJAX request that comes in from the server. Now you want to go update your UI. And there's also a child mutation, which is, kind of, which is what happens when you have like an input inside of your uh, template. And now when someone goes and edits it, you want to go update other things that are in the template. So that's mutations that happen from inside the template system as opposed to ones that happen from outside. And you'll see as I go forward that that actually ends up being an important distinction. Those two things are not necessarily the same. So the first thing that I want you to think about is um, basically a template is, in JavaScript, just a function. And this is both the implementation in most of the templating engines, most but not all. But also, I think a good way to think about conceptually what's happening, which is that you have a function which has the template in it. And when you invoke the function with some context, with some data, it's going to go and fill out the template. And what you get out the other end is some representation of the DOM. Uh, again, some template engines have, give you back a string of HTML. Some template engines give you DOM. Some template engines have you manipulate DOM directly. But at the end of the day, you get a thing that represents some HTML, and it will go into the DOM. The reason I'm papering over those differences is because these strategies actually tend to shift over time. So uh, the exact mechanisms actually aren't all that important. Um, and the way you should think about what happens at instantiation time is that you take the template, the function template, and you call it with parentheses with some data. And what happens as a result is that you get back some actual HTML, some actual DOM. 
And that, act, that part is actually very simple. If any, uh, how many people here have written backbone apps at some point? So like, even, like, basically the way you would write a backbone app is you would just do this step manually, and then you'd be done. And even if you write like, super simple apps, a lot of people use like, handlebars or mustache or something on its own, and those people uh, are also doing this step, right? You take the template and you instantiate it. So that's instantiation. I think that's pretty simple. Everyone understands what's going on. Now, once the difference between sort of the normal handlebars approach that people take when they're just writing a, a simple app and what happens in these data binding frameworks is that once you've actually called this function, the actual DOM that you created is, it sticks around. Even in React, where you're uh, re-rendering the template all the time, the original DOM that you created the first time sticks around. And what can happen sometimes is that you get something back from the server, and that server wants to change this model. So you can sort of think that there's the template and the call with the model and the resulting HTML are just sticking around all the time. And basically, the server will come back, and it will want to update this model. So it will change my age. Let's say I become 33 while the app is running. Take a very long time. But uh, if, if that happens, then what you want to have happen at a high level is you would like that 33 to update the DOM so it says, OK, you are now 33 years old. And there's a lot of different approaches for how exactly we make that happen. But again, from a high level, what happens is you got some new data from the outside world. You go and you update the DOM that's floating around. And again, even in React, um, it's important that we not forcibly update the entire DOM. No, there's no data mining framework that just throws, basically does the really simple thing, which is to re-render the entire thing and throw it in. So that's parent mutation. Um, Child mutation is actually a, a, a slightly different thing, and I'll change the example a little bit by adding an input element. So here there's an input element, and its value is age. So what happens is we now take this, we take this template, we instantiate it again with the data, and we get back, again, the same thing, only this time we, there's an input element in the output, and it has the value of 32 in it. And now a user can go in and type into that input element. So what happens is, from, again, from a very high level, is a user types into the value equals 33. And what you want to happen is, through some mechanism, you would like the underlying object to update so that it says 33. And then again, through some mechanism, you would like the text that says you are now 33 years old to update. So from a very high level, that's what data binding is. And that's true, again, no matter which data binding system you're using. So again, in all of the in everyone's effort to differentiate, they focus on the things that make them different. Th this is basically what makes all these systems the same. So I think child mutation is actually the most interesting. It's the one where there's the most um, differences in the model. And let's talk about how this happens. So from, again, from a very high level, what happens is, is that there is some thing out in the world. And when you change the input, you go notify that thing. And that thing will go and update the DOM. We'll go and update that H1 so that it contains the new value that you put in. Now, probably the one you're most familiar with, the, the version of this that you're most uh, comfortable with or have heard of the most is the simple observation model. Actually, a lot of people have used Angular. So you probably are aware of this, but you may not necessarily be, have been using exactly this model. But this is basically the model that Polymer uses and Knockout and Ember. It's kind of the oldest model. And the idea is that when you type into the name, the value property, when you type in the DOM, it goes and updates the object model directly. And then the object model is going to uh, also automatically update that name. So you didn't have to do anything special other than uh, have an object backing it. So simply by having an object backing this input and this H1 and typing into the input, it automatically updated the name. That's the, uh, the model that, inv that uses observation. Now, the pros of observation are that you get very predictable performance. So basically, it's a guarantee that when you type into that text field, the only thing that has to happen is updating that one H1. There's nothing else, no other work that has to happen. So it's very predictable. Uh, you also get transparent updates. So you don't have to do anything special to cause that data to flow from the input that you typed into the H1 that happens behind the scenes simply by setting up your template. 
And you also get the maximum amount possible of decouplings, right? So you can update that, uh, that model data however you want. So if you updated it from the server, it would also update the UI. You don't have to think about the differences between those cases. But there's actually um, two problems. One of them is fundamental, and one of them is not fundamental. So one of the problems is that other than object.observe, other than when you're using object.observe, you have to use some kind of JavaScript API. In Knockout, it's calling the function. In Ember, it's using .set. And that is necessary because there's no way in JavaScript today to observe every single time you change an object. Now, that problem is being solved with object.observe. So at some point in the future, that particular problem will go away. Um, but that's a problem that exists today with these systems. Um, the more fundamental problem with this system is that when you write a very big and complicated application, it's possible, it's not necessary, but it's possible for you to start getting a very complicated data flow, right? So because it's sort of the flip side of the transparent updates thing, because of the fact that the updates are so transparent, it becomes easy to write applications where the data is just flowing everywhere and you can't really think about it. Um, people who write good apps with Ember or Polymer or Knockout are careful about data flow, but I think it's somewhat well understood that a lot of people either getting started or they're coming from a different system um, can make a mess of things. So that's the con. Um, another very similar approach is whenever, the imp whenever you change the input, you notify some event bus. People usually call this thing pub sub. You notify some event bus, and then the H1 also registers a listener on that event bus, so that whenever you notify the event bus, it will notify the H1, and it will update. And you might notice from the diagram that this looks a lot like the previous diagram, with the exception of the fact that you have to do a little bit of more manual work. So the pros of this, and so this is how Backbone works. The pros of this is that it's very simple. When you're getting started and you only have a few things on the page, it's very easy to understand what's going on. You also get not the maximum amount of decoupling because you have to do, you have to manually set up listeners, but you get a reasonable amount of decoupling across your system. Um, unfortunately, the cons are that it's extremely repetitive. If anybody has written backbone apps, you'll know that the work to glue these things together um, can really add up. Uh, now, there's different ways to structure it. I don't want to make it sound like, because I previously said that Flux which is like a thing that people use with React, also does this. There's ways to structure this that are less repetitive, but I think fundamentally you have to say, listen to this event and then do some work in response to it. And that is more work than the transparent model. Um, it also often uses global, so I think this is pretty common. Uh, both Backbone and Flux, if you look at how they're normally described, uh, tell you to use global objects for to basically get a hold of the event bus and talk to it. There's other ways that you could structure it, and I think that would probably be good if people explored that, but the normal way that people talk about it is, is with globals. And then the, there's a, the con is sort of the similar thing as before, which is that it becomes non-obvious how your data is flowing, and it's actually worse than the, the sort of observation-based system because the data is flowing in a very ad hoc way based on the events that you set up. So it's not necessary. It can become very difficult to even imagine how somebody would have thought about structuring the data. Um, and I think those are reasons why people generally have moved away from using Backbone as the only way that they uh, shuttle data around. People usually use different, uh, different ideas. Now, there's another way that this works, which is called dirty checking. And basically, the idea behind dirty checking, you'll notice there's something weird about this, which is that you type into the input, and then there's no arrow pointing at the other event, and then somehow it gets updated. And the reason, the way that that works is that when you modify the underlying object, you also say, you basically tell the world a very, very um, granular thing, and actually Angular does this for you, which is like something might have happened. Something in the world might have happened, and then what Angular does is it goes and checks all the objects that are uh, inserted into DOM or that you registered a listener onto and checks to see if they change by basically diffing the objects. And then if anything changed, it will go and update the thing. So this is actually um, really similar to the, the first model, the model where you have observation, but it basically um, works around the fact that the observation model usually requires dot .set, right? So basically what they've said is, instead of requiring people to type dot .set manually, what we will do is we will basically just check every object that's involved in the system. Um, this has the same, some of the same pros that we saw before. 
the uh, updates happen mostly transparently. You don't have to necessarily worry about how you wire all these things up together. You get pretty good decoupling, and you have no dot set, and yet it works today, even though we don't have object that observe yet. Um, there's a couple of cons. Uh, the performance can be very unpredictable, and you have to go in and sort of figure out what's going on uh, when you get performance issues. I know people tend to say about all these systems, uh, you can worry about it when you hit it or whatever, but Angular style of dirty checking definitely has, of all the systems that exist today, has the most unpredictable performance. Um, it also can obscure data flow, just like the other models that we said before, in the sense that um, when you change something somewhere, it basically goes through, uh, goes through an invisible transparent path. And I should just be, I just remind everybody, I said this about all the models that we've talked about so far. Um, and then I have this little asterisk here, which is basically that um, it's mostly transparent updates, but you still have to register watches if you want to do something outside of the DOM. So if you want to listen for an object and then propagate the information to another object as opposed to the DOM, you have to do some manual work. And that's work that you don't ever have to do in the DOM, but you do have to do between objects. So um, those are sort of the cons. Um, the new kid on the block is the React model, which is called virtual DOM. And I have here ember.next question mark because we're definitely exploring ways to incorporate these ideas into Ember. Um, in the future. And the idea here is actually a little, it's a little bit different. It looks very similar to previous diagrams, but it's a little bit different. And basically the way it works is there's very predictable data flow. So if you want, if you have an input and you want to change it, basically the way you communicate that is always to your parent component. So you tell your parent component, hey, I have some changes that I would like to make, and the parent component will basically go and re-render the child. And as part of the re-rendering -re process, React will say, okay, I see I have this old representation of DOM before. I see that something has changed, so I have to re-render it. I'm going to re-render a new representation, and then I'll compare them, figure out what the differences are, and update them. And there's a few, uh, few pros here. Probably the most important pro, no matter what anybody tells you about React, the most important pro of all is that the data flow has become extremely explicit. So when you want to make a change, you always talk to a parent, which might talk to its parent, might talk to its parent, and then changes flow downward. You basically say, okay, I'm going to re-render. Somebody, some parent decides to re-render. That's the most important idea of React, in my opinion. And it's the idea that there is some owner in your view hierarchy that control, that owns some data. And it basically pr gives permission downward for things to uh, mutate it using callbacks. And, but there are some cons here. Uh, so first of all, somebody has to actually call uh, set state in the, in the DOM somewhere. And this works really, really well for child mutation. So if what you're doing is uh, you're inside of the whole view system and you make a change inside the view system, it's really easy to see how you set it. You basically propagate the event up to some parent. Some parent basically re-renders itself and the data flows down and that works great. Um, it works a little bit less great when you get data in from the server because now you have to somehow tell, you got data from the server, you have to somehow tell some area of DOM what to update. And in some applications, the, there's not necessarily a direct coupling between the dat a particular data that you got from the server and a piece of UI. So you have to basically do a mapping between data that you got from the server and what UI needs to be updated in order to respond to external events, um, which is why I say there's some asterisks around uh, service, uh, server coordination. There's also some performance edge cases. If, it, if you get into some really extreme cases, it's not the most predictable performance. However, React does a really smart thing that's different from Angular. So you might have heard me say diffing in both cases and say, oh, that sound like a very similar thing. It seems like they would have the same performance. But actually, they're different. So uh, the Angular approach basically has to diff all the data that might be involved. So imagine that you have a million pieces of data, and they, can, they count into a single number. You have a million items in an array. They count into a single number. Um, in, An in Angular, and maybe they're not you know, a million numbers, because that would kind of be the same, but maybe they're a million uh, complicated objects, and you're like digging into them, and you have to figure something out. In Angular, you have to basically diff the entire million object array. What React does is it basically just recomputes the new value, and then it just checks to see whether the thing on the screen is the same as the last thing on the screen. And that's actually a lot less checking. And um, importantly, the amount of checking that you might have to do is bounded by how many things you can fit on a screen which is much smaller than the amount of data that might power the things that are on the screen, right, by like a huge amount, right? The amount of data powering the things on the screen is a much, much bigger list than the amount of things that are actually on the screen. So React did a very smart thing, which is that they constrained the diffing work to what is actually on the screen, which keeps, it, keeps the performance from getting insane in relatively common cases. It takes more extreme edge cases to hit the limits of their diffing algorithm. So that's child mutation.
So those are sort of the, I think, the three big picture things. This is how they, how they work. Um, but actually, a, a kind of interesting thing is that I sort of alluded to the fact that there are different ways that the system works. And one example of this is, OK, so I talked about instantiation. And I think people probably in their head thought about something like, well, I got some, I loaded the page. Let me go make an AJAX request. When I do it, I'll create a new view, which is like kind of the normal way in both Backbone and React. And then I'll insert it into the page. But actually, there's another instantiation step, which is when you navigate to another page, right? So you go from, you started from the index, and then you navigate it to some other page. There's another instantiation step. So ideally, these two would use similar code paths. They would not be totally different. And you wouldn't have to learn a whole new mode of thinking if you decided to go from very simple, you only have one bootstrap, to a navigation. So kind of the way this works is that for bootstrap instantiation the first time, uh, in Backbone and React, it's kind of up to you. You can do whatever you want, which a lot of people see as a positive. It lets you basically take a component and just like throw it into the DOM, and it will work. Um, Angular actually does the bootstrapping for you by looking for the app attribute, and then it goes and instantiates controllers and lets them power the bootstrapping process. And Ember uh, also does things automatically through the router. So the router is basically the instantiation bootstrapping step. Now, with navigation, Again, I, like I said, you would like this to be the same. You would like navigating once you're in the app to go through a similar code path as the one that you were in in the first place. Uh, Backbone gives you a router here, so you can basically move your instantiation logic into the router. It's optional. You have to decide to use it. Um, React basically still says leave it up to you, although there's some good community solutions. Um, Angular also has an optional router that you could decide to use once you get into it. And again, Ember just has a router, so you had a router in the, in, in the first place with a single route. Now you have multiple routes. I think this is a nice thing. Uh, parent mutation is kind of a, a, a similar thing. There's like different, uh, or I, I called this external mutation before. Um, there's different ways that you could get some external data to update. So sometimes it's an AJAX re request that came from your app. So like a user hit the save button or something, and that triggered an AJAX request. Um, sometimes it's like a WebSocket that's streaming or you're polling, right? So sometimes the data comes from another, another way. And I think fundamentally there's two different ways of doing this. You could either uh, do it indirectly through like an observable system or through uh, some kind of pub sub system. Or you could do it directly by coupling the AJAX response that you got to some particular part of the DOM. Again, if, it, if the AJAX request was initiated in the first place through the view layer, that's pretty easy. If the uh, AJAX request was initiated or the WebSocket request was in initialized outside the DOM, now you have to figure out what piece of the DOM correspond to a particular piece of data. Um, so these are sort of the two approaches. Again, my view is that ideally internal and external uh, updates should be the same. They should go through a similar code path because otherwise you have to write a bunch of code for updating the DOM if you get if the request comes in through Ajax and a whole bunch of other code for updating the DOM if the request came in from uh, from inside of your uh, from inside of your view hierarchy. And this is sort of the the idea behind Ember at a high level, which is that instantiation and navigation both go through the router. So basically, there's not like two different paths that you might that might be inconsistent with each other. You're always going through the router. And but all kinds of mutation go through the observable system. Although, like I said, I think we're looking at ways to incorporate some of the React programming model into Ember. Um, keep an eye out for that. But the idea is that observable objects are basically the only way that you update data. So the result of that is that there's basically one consistent path. So however, if your data could be updated in a particular way because you edited something in the DOM, your data would be updated the same way if, you get, if it came in through an AJAX request. And um, projects like Ember Data, basically their job is to coordinate these things and make them be the same. And I don't want to spend too much time on this table. I'm sure it's online and whatever. But the basic idea, I think, is that you can sort of make a table of the popular frameworks that exist and look at how instantiation, navigation, internal and external works. And before people tell me, because I have like your choice for React and other things, um, I don't want, before people tell me too much like, oh, there's solutions in the ecosystem, that is definitely true. Um, this is like a table with just React, so you can use, for example, Flux, and you can use React Router, and those will start to fill in some of the boxes, and that's, that's really awesome. I'm glad ecosystems do it. Um, my general feeling is that it's better if the framework is basically trying to figure out how this all fits together, just because trying to piece together a bunch of solutions that work for each one of these individual boxes don't necessarily produce a coherent whole story. So uh, that's sort of my, that's the, the basic idea here is that um, there is this thing called data bindings. It has kind of these four pieces. Um, 
There's a lot of different ways that people are doing things. I think uh, Ember's pitch is that we try to keep things very consistent. React's pitch is that they try to keep things very uh, easy to reason about. Again, keep an eye out. We're thinking about how to coordinate these things. Um, but I think, I think that's the story. So uh, with all that said, I want to get back to my not hello world and show you how I build Ember apps every day. OK, so I'm going to just for a second just show you the app so that you get a sense of what's happening. So I'm going to just reload here. Hopefully, it will work. Yes, I know it's conference Wi-Fi. We use WebSocket, so it's super speedy. Yes, that was a joke, sort of. Um, OK, so you see here, basically, this is, this is actually our own app. And you can see that we've got a graph of response times and requests per minute. Um, the response times are the 95th percentile for people who know what that means. It's a good, good idea. Um, and then you have a list of all the endpoints, and you can click on one of them. If you click on it, it basically gives you a distribution of, the of all the response times and a trace. Come on, conference Wi-Fi. Load. Why are you throwing me conference Wi-Fi? I'll try to reload. Ah, there we go. So you can see that there's a list of, there's a basically a trace. And if I click on any of the pieces, it basically tells me exactly what SQL query it is. And this is like 500,000 requests represented as a single trace. Um, and But the really cool thing is that you can select like a particular area. So you can say, like, I just want the fastest request or all the requests under 50 milliseconds. And then you get a trace for just those requests. So in particular, the thing that you normally want to do is like, I, w I only care about requests that are more than 200 milliseconds. And then you can see, OK, here's what's taking time. Um, we also have a couple other things like this little database thing means that we detected a particular problem. And the problem is that this query was repeated multiple times. And you can probably group them together and get better performance. OK, so that's the basic idea. Um, one thing that's pretty cool about Ember is that if you open up the Ember inspector over here, even though this is a production app, we basically you can basically look at the app and get a sense of what's going on. And it does this without any performance cost, except when the, app, when the inspector's open. So obviously, if the inspector's open, there's some cost. But it's extremely low overhead for non-inspector usage. Um, and so the idea is you can sort of see how things are structured over here. You can see a list of all the routes on the page. You can see it's a simple app, but we have a bunch. Part of that is routes, like the loading route. Um, you can go into data here, and that basically shows you all the pieces of data that are loaded. So for example, if I go into app, if I click on this, you'll see that there it says, here's the two apps. I can click on one of these things. I can change its name. So Yehuda, I hit Enter, changes it. And now you can see it changes it here and here. But also, if I was to go into my billing, you'll see that it changed, right? Because it's basically, so this is kind of what I was mentioning before. There are some pieces of data that are actually not necessarily corresponding to one particular piece of UI. They might be representing a bunch of UI. And for that, you really do want to have like a store of stuff. Um, and this is basically how you look at that store. You can see the global store and play around with it. Can people generally see what I'm doing? Hope so. Um, there's also this render performance tab. So if I start clicking around, it'll tell you how long it took to render things. So it took 200 milliseconds. And then it'll tell you, OK, the Time Explorer took 14 milliseconds. And there's an outlet. And if I go into that, you can see that the if error took some time, right? So I can basically drill in and figure out exactly what thing is taking a lot of time. So basically, it turns out to be these, this loop, which is not all that surprising. OK. So from a high level, when you go into an Ember app for the first time, Oh, I should, uh, I'll switch over to the development. So over here, I have, uh, I have an Ember app in my, on my computer. I'm using Ember CLI, which I think everyone should use if they're starting a new Ember app. And so I can just type in Ember server. And when I type in Ember server, it will boot. And it will tell me how much time was spent on different steps. So the Ember CLI will automatically do things like compile my compass for me and things like that. And uh, it, want, it tells me how much time everything took eventually once it's all done, uh, basically so that I can complain to plugin authors if something's taking too long. It also uses Broccoli, so this is all the first, the first time, so ES next filter and whatnot. But if I reload, it will not take as much time. 
So here I am, skylight.dev. If I reload, you'll see that it loaded pretty quick. Ah, this part is actually connecting to my staging server. So, so what's actually happening here is that the way we develop Skylight is that we get our data from the staging server because it's a somewhat complicated bunch of data, but the app itself is um, developed locally. So um, anyway, so it was able to boot. Seems good. I should now remove the feature that I already wrote since that would be pretty boring. So. to my template. Okay. So the feature that I'm going to build right now is I'm going to add, I'm going to add a, sort, a thing that allow you to filter the endpoints. So you can see here there's a pretty big list of endpoints. There are no, ah, I see. I did not properly revert it. Sorry, bros. OK. Getting back to clean slate. So you can see there's a big list of endpoints, and maybe I would like to be able to filter them by a specific thing. So actually doing this UI correctly in the real world is pretty annoying, but I will do a bad UI job just to show the API, just showing how things are built. So the first thing is I need to figure out, OK, I have a big app, right? I have, if you look here, if you go into my templates, there's a pretty big list of templates. There's all these controls. I have an app. So how do I know which one of these templates I actually want to be looking at? So basically what I do is I go into the Ember inspector, and I, sorry, that was the wrong one of these guys. I can select, and this tells me, OK, that's the application template, right? And actually what I would probably do here is not use that little, this little thingy. Let me turn it off. But I would basically hover over these guys, OK? And I see, OK, I can see that this thing that's selecting this whole area is the endpoints, uh, the endpoints page. That's the high-level template that goes into it. And you can see that the template name for it is endpoints. So that's good. So I can go into the endpoints list. But if you look here, you can see there's a lot of stuff going on. So that clearly isn't the whole story here. So what I want to do is I'll basically show all components now that I've gotten a sense of where it is that I want to go. And you can see that. Um, you can now see the whole list of components. Actually, I don't think this helps me that much in this particular situation. OK. But you, know, you now know that you can get a list of all the components. OK. So what I want to do, you can see there's a bunch of stuff going on. If there's an error, I show the error. Otherwise, if it's locked, then I show the lock. I show that it's locked, which I think I'm going to go off script and just see if I can make it be locked. So it's looking at an app, right? So if I go into here, so this $E thing basically will just dump the object to the inspector so I can type $E. And I think it should have an is locked on it. So what if I set it to true? OK, now you can see that it tells me that the application is locked, right? So I can play around, see what those templates actually are. I should probably not do that in practice so I can keep working. OK, great. OK, so uh, if the app is locked, OK, that's not the situation. So OK, what we probably want is the app is fully loaded and has endpoints. And you can see it goes to endpoints slash list. So that's where we want to go. So what we're going to do is we're just going to hop over into the endpoint list. And you can see here a little bit further down that it says eat, eat every item in the list controller. So. OK, so it's the list controller. So let's go find the list controller. And you'll see when I open it, endpoint list. This is a pretty boring controller. Basically, all it does is uh, sort things by importance. So we have this importance property, and we sort by it. So um, the way that that works is that there's a sort by it defaults to agony. But if I switch to response time or something, it will basically sort. And what's happening is that this controller is managing that process. If you're familiar with iOS at all, it's kind of similar to that kind of idea. There's a controller that's managing that. Um, so what we want to do is we want to change this so that instead of it just using the sorted array controller, we want it to use a sorted and filtered thing. And we actually don't have a filter by, but it's pretty easy to write by hand. So um, what I want to do is basically expose a property 
which is going to be the thing that we're filtering by, and then I want to use it in the template. So I'll just start by adding uh, endpoint filter null. So it's an endpoint filter. It starts off as null. And then when I go back into the list, on top of the table, I'm just going to say, uh, so it's, it's inside of the list controller again. List con uh, well, so I'll, if I just do list controller dot uh, endpoint filter, it won't do anything. That's probably not what we want. We want uh, input value equals, right? So we're making an input, and its value is this list controller. This list controller's endpoint filter. OK, so let me refresh. And now we should see that there is a, come on. Now you can see this element. And again, it only appears once, the actu when there's, a, once there's actually something to filter, because it's scoped inside of the template that appears in that situation. So that's great. I can type, but we didn't actually hook it up. There's actually another thing that we do in our app, which is pretty cool. And I'll show you an example of it and then use it here, which is, uh, I'll act for it. Well, that was not exactly what I wanted. So we have this feature that we basically wrote for our app called Feature Flag. And the basic idea is that you can basically wrap anything in a feature flag. So this is basically how people, I think, should build apps, which is that you have, you're not building on a branch that you someday merge in. You're basically building the feature on master, but it's hidden behind a feature flag. And that way, not only could you test it out locally and make sure, everything, and make sure the rest of your team is keeping things consistent with it, but you could also have customers try it out if you tell them to turn on the feature flag. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a new feature flag, um, which is going to be endpoint filter. So it's, uh, it's block feature flag, flag equals endpoint filter slash feature flag. And now if I refresh, you'll see that it will go away once it loads. I'm sorry that there's a lot of refreshing on very bad conference Wi-Fi. I guess you're not getting the real day in a life, because in real life, it would not take this long. Um, so you can see that the feature flag is not there anymore. Um, and I believe that there is a dw.toggle flag. And what do we call it? Endpoint filter. So if we toggle it, the flag appears. If we toggle again, it goes away. And there's actually a config file somewhere floating around, if this finishes loading, which should have a list of all the flags. So here's a list of all the flags that are on by default. So you can see that we have, right now, the only actual flag is called inspections. And you can see that we have turned it on by default. And that way, we, we start like pushing out the customers. But if something bad happened, it's still all inside the feature flag infrastructure. So we could disable it and roll it back quickly without having to figure out how to revert all that code. So that's basically how we build new features. So OK, so we have this feature. Um, and actually, another cool thing is, if you look at local storage here, You'll see that there is a Skylight feature flag. So obviously, this is not like a production usage. But this allows, if I reload the page now, it will continue to have this feature. So obviously, if you're working on the feature all the time, you don't want to have to constantly be turning it on from the console. Right? So OK. So we have, we have the input. Great. And at, uh, if you know, if you've used like Angular or Ember before, um, perhaps you could intuit that this list controller got endpoint filter as I type into it is going to update the, the list controller. So. Let's go back to the list controller. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new property, and it's going to be called filtered endpoints. And Ember has this thing called computed properties, and that's a property that you can, uh, that it runs a function, but you can use it from a template. So unlike other frameworks, Ember does not allow you to use just write any old JavaScript expression in templates. Um, part of that is desire to be compatible with object.observe in the future, but part of it is we just think it gets pretty crazy. Um, so you can, but you can write computed properties, which will work in your template. So uh, the way you write a computer property is you just make a function. You give it, you say it's a property. In this case, the property will. And you say what it depends on. In this case, the, what the property depends on is any change to the underlying array whatsoever. So that would be like if we change the filter or something like that, but also any change to the endpoint filter. So what we're saying is if either of those th two things changes, recompute this value. And this is going to be the list of things that we're filtering by. And what we want to do is we want to say, OK, uh, var, and var filter equals this.get endpoint filter. So the first step is 
if there's no filter, which is going to be true if it's either null or an empty string, then we'll just return this, which is the current the thing that we would have been uh, so we would have been enumerating before. But if there is a filter, then what we want to do is we want to return this dot filter takes a function with an with a endpoint, and we'll just say inside of here return uh, endpoint dot name. So let me let me show you. So remember that we had this list of endpoints. So if I go back into the Ember inspector, we have this list of endpoints. I can click on the model. That brings up this thing. I can just dump out the items to the console. That shows me that there's a list of objects here. And hold on, let me see if I can actually, no, I cannot. And then you can see inside of here that there is a name, which is admin invoices controller hash show. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that and we're going to say, if the thing that you typed is inside of there, then show it, otherwise hide it. So this is kind of traditional JavaScript filtering. So um, I'll just use a really bad technique. I could use a regex or something else, but use a really bad technique. Um, so if the filter uh, does not equal minus one. So what we've now done is we say, OK, if there's no filter, return the whole thing. If there is a filter, filter by it, basically. And we have to do one last thing, which is that right now in the list, we're saying each list controller, so it's enumerating over the list controller, we want to now enumerate over the list controller's uh, filtered endpoints. And remember that if there is no filter, we return the original list controller, so that's going to keep working. So let me refresh. By the way, one thing I, I kind of want to show here is that there's a lot of stuff going on in this app, but I'm able to focus on just this one feature and not have it sort of spill out into the rest of the application, and that's something uh, we work really hard on in Ember, and it's like a, one of the raison d'etre of Ember is to enable uh, applications to grow and grow and grow, and still the parts of it that you need to think about when you're editing one individual part is isolated to kind of as if you were building a lot of little components, right? If you were, if you were building a lot of little React components, probably the coordination between them would get complicated. Um, but the idea is to basically keep all them isolated from each other in Ember, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so here we go. Uh, what I'm going to do, you can see that it has done nothing. So now I'm going to type some stuff, and you can see that it started to work, which is great. I can delete. I can say track error, right? And one thing that we should check to make sure it worked, if you know data binding frameworks, you should expect this to work, but we should confirm that it works, which is, OK, so when I type in track, you can see that it's sorted by agony. So uh, this 424 milliseconds is actually lower on the list, even though it has a higher response time than track status because it happens less often. And we just do an algorithm to try to um, give you things that you should work on that are both slow and happen a lot. So if things are very infrequent, they move lower in the list. But because sometimes people just want some other sorting, we give them a sorting uh, thing. And you can, click, you can click name, which if you look here, it says the gold standard in ordering of lists as a joke. Uh, so you can see that it still works. Um, and if I was to delete, you can see that this sorting is still working. And it's important to note that this is not working because we just did anything in our current feature to make it still work. It still works because of the fact that these two features were implemented orthogonally from each other and they just they compose together, right? So we have, uh, because of the way that we specify the dependency here, right? So if you go to endpoint list, we said that we depend on this thing here means let me recompute this value if the underlying list changes at all. And we implement the sorting functionality using the built-in Ember functionality that just updates the list. Whenever the list got updated, we updated uh, the filtered endpoints and vice versa. Right? So basically, that just worked on its own. Cool. And one thing worth uh, noting is if I click on one of these things and hit the back button, you can see that it persists, right? So by def this is a little bit um, a field, I guess. But Ember does a, does a lot of work and it increasing all the time. This is one of the things that I think people don't think a lot about, but it actually ends up being important. We don't do it perfectly now, but I think we will be uh, will be working on making it better over time. Is in general, if you just use Ember and you start navigating around, things that you would expect to have persist will continue to persist. And of course, there's ways to escape valve out and turn those behaviors off. But in general, if you had some state inside of your inside of a, a text field and you go to another page and come back to it, what you expect is that the text field still has the state in it. And we try to make that so. OK, so I think that's all. Um, yeah. 
I don't think I have anything else to say. You can see that it's still, like everything works, all the other features still continue to work, obviously. So I guess that's the, the thing, is hopefully this, I, I guess here's what I would say. Hopefully when you watch me right now, you said to yourself, that seems really similar to all the other data finding frameworks that I've ever used. It looks really, um, it looks like it has sort of the same story. You have some computations, you put them in the DOM, when you, you, know, you type something in, it causes something to update, et cetera. But what I hope I showed you was that Ember, that is actually the story that Ember gives you for real later on in the life cycle of your app. So this app is over a year old now. I hopped in, this is the real, this is like master of Skylight. You're seeing me work on the real thing. Um, and I didn't have to do anything crazy to make it work. IJC just implemented it the way you would implement sort of a beginner thing. Now, in, what a lot of people say when they start using Ember, thank you, what a lot of people say when they start using Ember is like, oh, it seems like there's a lot of stuff to learn. Um, and that is definitely the case, and it's also something we work on. But sort of the trade-off for learning that stuff is that this, uh, you, you basically get the continued good scaling over time. You've basically learned enough to keep things working over time. You don't have to basically keep learning or re rethinking everything when you, once you start it. So basically this presentation that I just gave you is actually rather similar to Hello World presentations I've given before, and that was kind of intentional, obviously. But it was also like the feature that I came up with to show was a feature that I sat down with Tom and said, okay, like help me come up with a feature I want to present. I want, I want it to both be you know, relatively easy to present in a short period of time, but also uh, a, feature, a real feature we might actually build in real life. And like, let's try to do that. Um, I want to say a couple things about Ember CLI real quick. Um, actually, let me do one quick refactor. So one thing that Ember CLI is doing for us is that I, before this, I installed, I did uh, npm install Ember CLI dash es next dash dash save dev. So I typed in that line, and that gave me the es next compiler. And what this lets me do, among other things, is use the new es6 arrow functions. Uh, it occurs to me I didn't talk about the modules thing at all, but I will should do that as well. I have a few minutes, it looks like. So I can use arrow functions. And if I reload, the correct behavior here is that it continues to work exactly as before, <laughs> um, unless I typoed. Yeah, so it continues to work exactly as before. Come on, okay. And if I type in like track, continues to work, right? So there's basic ES Next as a library. It's kind of like Tracer, but it's uh, more modular and, it, and the features that it comes with are more stable in general. They're better implemented, I think. Um, so basically installing ES Next is something that the Ember CLI tool lets you do. It lets you install things that didn't come with the Ember CLI tool, but which are designed to work with it. And there's a lot of, tool, there's a lot of things like that. So Ember, Ember Data, and a bunch of stuff like that are, are distributed that way. So that's cool. Um, the other thing that I would say about Ember CLI is, so this slowest trees thing is cool. One thing that's interesting, if you look at it, typically after the first build, the by far the slowest thing is Compass Compiler, and that's because it's really hard to avoid rebuilding the entire Compass. That's something that people have been working on for a long time. But things, you'll look here and you'll see that the ES Next build is not even on this list, because even though we have a lot of files, uh, we're using a tool called Broccoli under the hood, which basically allows you to make changes to some file and have it just recompile that one thing. So basically, we, you, can, you can have a lot of transpilers. You can have like the ES6 module transpiler. You can have ES Next. You can have a lot of these transpilers running at the same time. And after the first build, which may take a little while, incremental updates are very fast. Um, and I realize I should say something about um, ES6 modules. So if you're looking at this and you're a JavaScript programmer, you're probably either saying, oh, cool, they're using the new module syntax. But more likely, you're like, WTF is going on here. Um, and basically what's happened is that uh, Square has built a transpiler for the new module syntax um, called ES6 module transpiler, and it comes with Ember CLI. So if you use Ember CLI, you get this by default. And the basic idea is that you can use module syntax and it will automate, and you can, so basically things like um, the templates, right? But also things like the actual JavaScript are just little modules that, get, that import Ember stuff and export uh, single export stuff. So Ember, if Ember wants the nav controller, it will look for controller slash nav, and it will, it will basically require that file in node parlance, and it will look at the exports, and it will use the default export. Um, I would recommend looking at, uh, there's a thing I made called jsmodules.io. If you want to learn more about ES6 modules, check it out. Um, tells you a lot about it, but I think the TLDR is we took cool things from node and made a syntax out of it, and also made, fixed some bugs and how the node stuff works. You can now see, by the way, that Skylight is really fast <laughs> because it loaded in a plausible amount of time, and this is a single, this is a static website served off GitHub, and it's taking a very long time, so.
Cool. So that's sort of the day in the life, I guess. I probably have like a few minutes I can take questions, maybe. Is that true? Can I take a few questions? We can make two questions, actually. I can take two questions. Awesome. Quem tem pergunta, pessoal? Pro Yehuda, levanta a mão. Vamos fazer duas. Como assim? Come on. Ah, ali, achei. I see a person waving his hand. Yep. You have to sprint. I only have like. I'll throw the microphone on him. It's like the bucket brigade here. Uh, meu nome é Enio. Uh, <coughs> Ehuda, nice talk. Uh, I saw that you're not using the pod structure in an uh, Ember CLI. The uh, what? I'm the sorry? Pods. Ah, pod structure. Yeah. Uh, so why is that? Are you, are you Ember going to use it by default or not? Good question. So first I should explain what is the pod structure. So there's basically two ways that people could structure an app like this. Um, sort of the traditional way, which is derived from server-side frameworks, is you have like a controllers directory, templates directory, whatever like that, and you just put everything in there, and you can reason usually reasonably find stuff. It's like somewhat well understood. And then there's the pod structure, which I like a lot and prefer, which is basically you put all the things related to each other in one place. So like if you were going to look at the endpoints page, you would have an endpoints directory, and inside of that you would have all the related templates and all the related controllers and all the related routes in one place. Um, and a similar example of this, which we thought about recently, is in Ember Data, there's like a model and a serializer and an adapter that you might want to put in one place. So that should be a pod. Uh, the, an the answer is I like the pod structure. I am personally pushing for it to become the default in Ember CLI. I think it will be. Um, but this app, this project predates that decision. So um, we're just using what was the default when we switched to Ember CLI a few like three months ago, I guess. Um, but we def I definitely prefer the pod structure. One thing that I should be clear about, though, is that I do not, I only prefer the pod structure because it seems like everybody agrees. I would not want like half of the Ember CLI projects to be pod structure and half of the Ember CLI projects to be like the rail structure um, because I think that would make it really confusing. I really want people to hop into Ember apps and have a general understanding of where they expect to find stuff. So um, I think most people agree. If you're asking that question, it sounds like you probably also agree. And um, I think some backbone framework like Marionette or somebody like came up with it, and I like it. We're going to do it. Mais uma pergunta, pessoal. Oh, aqui do lado. One more question. Yehuda, thank you for the uh, good talk. No um, problem. From your vantage point with your work with JavaScript, um, one big overarching theme in this conference has been bridging the mobile to um, native app, and a little bit about um, service workers and a lot of other things. Where do you see this going? What are some big components? Uh, what, what do you see from the 20,000 foot view? Cool, that's a really good question. I will try to answer it quickly. Um, so I think there's a general problem, which is like, how do you deal with the fact that the web seems not as well suited for mobile apps as platforms built for mobile apps? I don't find that surprising, by the way. Um, so the web's big advantage, of course, is the fact that it's portable. It runs on any device, so there's going to be some cost related to the fact that it will not naturally work well on every device. But I think the web also has shown historically that we're very good at fixing those problems given enough time. Um, and I think, I think it's valuable. Um, I think there's an unfortunate thing that happens, which I will ask you to keep an eye out for and fight, which is that some, uh, a lot of people who are us run into problems like offline in 2008 or something, seven, and say, why does offline not work? And it's very easy for the solution to offline to be, oh, we'll just hack in an offline solution. App cache seems good. And then what happens, what tends to happen is that even I look at a feature, and it's not necessarily obvious to me without really trying to use it in an app how effective it's going to be. So like the entire JavaScript community is like, oh, offline, I hear we solved that with app cache. Awesome, solved, offline, solved. Everyone can go home now. And then, Facebook will try to use it, or like some enterprise and developers will try to use it, and we'll notice it's not working that well, and we'll go start saying on mailing lists in public, like, hey, I think app cache is not working that well, but nobody wants to admit that the official offline solution is failing, so everyone's like, no, you're clearly using it wrong. You need to like work harder. Here are some workarounds, whatever. But what needed to have happened was that as soon as Facebook and Microsoft, Microsoft was like, hey, we're noticing that app cache is not working that well for Microsoft users. Can we get this fixed? And the process was very painful to get it fixed. So uh, I 
service worker is much better because it's a lower level thing. I think um, the way that web developers and the platform tend to work the best together is that the platform provides low level functionality and library authors write higher level stuff on top. Um, sometimes the lower level is crazy, like IndexedDB, and it takes a really long time to build stuff on top. But typically, low level stuff, people write libraries like mscripten. Like we got you know, array buffer and ASMJS, and now we can run Unity at almost native speed on, in a web browser, right? So I think we're, we're good at this. And so the thing that we should be advocating for in general is fewer things like app cache and more things like service worker. Um, and I have a thing called Extensible Web Manifesto, which tries to talk about this. Uh, that was faster, um, which is basically saying this exact thing, which is that the, f the feedback loop between browser vendors and web authors is the fastest when the browser vendors provide low-level stuff and maybe, maybe libraries, like Polymer is really cool. Polymer is the browser saying we're going to provide some low-level stuff, but we're also going to tell you how we expect it to be used. And we're going to write some libraries. We're going to put some manpower into that. That's great, because what that means is that if Polymer is wrong, then maybe Ember or Angular or somebody else can use those same low-level stuff to try something else. Or maybe people can fork Polymer and try other options, as opposed to, oh, you know, let's just get it into the browser, and then if you're wrong, it's basically like game over. Um, Dave Herman gave the keynote at EmberConf, and what he said is that kind of the iteration that you want is a loop where you go, um, you know, implement a feature, get some feedback, uh, fix it, start back at step one, right? That's what you want. But in the web, there's a thing that says, uh, ship it, and then immediately after that it says, get some feedback, throw, don't break the web, right? And basically that's the problem, is that when you actually put a high level thing in the platform, it's very, very difficult to evolve it because of the fact that it's break, gonna break the web if you change it. And as a person who works on Sanders, I can tell you that this is a real consideration. Like, people don't wanna break the web, and that, what that means is that people don't ship things very fast. And the best, the best answer that we have is ship low level stuff, because we know how to ship low level stuff, and there's low, less risk there, there's security risk, there's performance risk, but that's stuff browser vendors are really awesome at, actually. Um, so ship stuff at a low level, and then let library authors, like the people in this room largely, let us figure it out. And if we come up with really good stuff that people tend to use, sure, we can standardize that stuff at that point. That's great. That, Brendan I calls that paving cow paths. Let's do more of that. But we need to actually get things involved. Promises are a good example of something that um, was heavily used in user land and we were able to basically just pick it up, make some small tweaks, fix some bugs, and put it in the spec. And now it's actually gonna be in ES6, and the, the module loader will use it, and it's gonna be in DOM, right? And that's because we did a really good job of flushing it out in, the, in, the, in user land. So I guess my answer to your question is that, assuming all this goes well, what we'll have is more things like uh, Service Worker, and what that will mean is not, you might be thinking, oh, that sounds terrible, now I'll have to write all this code. But you should not think that. What you should think is, if we get a lot of low-level stuff, we can figure it out, because we know how to do that. And browser vendors know how to expose low-level stuff, so let's let them do what they're good at, and let's us do what we're good at, and then let's eventually standardize. Um, and, I, and I think people should be pushing for that. And I think, it, again, I'll just reiterate, I think people have a tendency to look at stuff like AppCache and say, I'm happy they did something. Let me, let me shout from the rooftops that this is awesome. But you should not do that. You should be pushing for low-level stuff, because lower-level stuff is more likely to allow us, like the thing, only thing we have going for us is all of us, right? Apple doesn't have all of this. Apple has some guys in a room working on iOS. We have all of this, so let's leverage the hell out of that. <laughs>